Want help to grow your business? Download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today. Hello and welcome to Masters of Business. My name is Dan Gregory. I'm also known as the fat one off the gruel and transfer, but that's because people on Twitter suck. But what I'd really like to talk to you about today is how do we build a brand that people love? Now, why would we want to build a brand that people love? Well, well, the main reason is it creates an environment of attraction. It means you don't have to work quite so hard to make every sale, to find new business. But before we get on to how do we build a brand that people love, let's have a look at what's happening in the marketplace that's driving this need to build that brand. And I think the first thing that we can all agree on is that we're living in an age of unprecedented change. Don't you think? I mean, just 20 years ago, my business partners and I were the only people we knew who had email addresses. Classic early adopters, right? The only people we could send email to was each other. Spent the whole day going, can I borrow your pencil? Send. Do you get it? And yet, I now approve video content that gets emailed to my iPhone as a YouTube link. 20 years, just long enough for one generation to reach adulthood, and the world has changed in ways none of us could have predicted. And we say things like we like change, don't we? We say things like, oh, change is as good as a holiday, but we don't really mean that. Just try putting change in a staff member's remuneration package in place of their annual leave. Yeah, we'll see how far that gets you. In fact, human beings, even those of us who are early adopters, are hardwired to resist change. We find change threatening. When Coca-Cola changed their formula and invented new Coke, it almost destroyed their business. Every time Facebook changes their layout, people lose their minds. Burger King took the Whopper off the menu for one day in 2010, and this is what happened. The Burger King doesn't have the Whopper. They might, they might as well change their name to Burger Queen. Yeah. So we don't particularly like change. In fact, we find change threatening. And a lot of that change is being driven by the fact that we're living through a, a digital revolution, the equivalent of the industrial revolution that changed the world about 100 years ago. There's a lot of people out there in the world that are currently working as blacksmiths Miss Smiths, and just don't realize it yet. And this digital revolution is changing the way we do business. It's changing all kinds of businesses. Think about how we buy music today versus how we used to buy music just five or 10 years ago. Or how we buy books today versus you know, a decade ago. When I released my first book, I went to book signings at bookstores. You don't do that so much today because there aren't so many bookstores around. And this is changing every industry, even those industries that are far more about personal relationships and human connection. You know, even the real estate industry, if you think about how we buy a house today versus how we used to buy houses, you know, you used to have to go to a real estate agent to find out what was for sale in a particular suburb or a particular area. But today, you go to realestate.com.au or you go to domain.com.au, you have a look at pictures of the house, you have a look at the, the, the price fluctuations in the neighborhood on, on the houses either side. You do a virtual tour, you've been inside the house. You haven't even spoken to a real estate agent. So this digital revolution is fundamentally changing the way we, we do business and fundamentally changing the way we connect with other human beings. It's even affecting us at a values and a cultural level. Today, one in five American couples found each other through online dating. One in five. You know, we used to get dressed up or, or shave or put on makeup before we went out on a date. Today, we're all just learning how to use Photoshop. So this digital revolution is changing the way we do business. And it's changing the way we, we seek the opinion of other people. It's changing who we look to as influencers. Today, social networking is the number one internet activity ahead of porn. Ahead of porn. Apparently, today, we really just do want to be friends. But by population, Facebook is now the third largest nation on Earth in just 10 years. This is changing the way we connect. It's also changing the way we build our business reputation. Today, TripAdvisor is the most influential travel organization on the planet, more so than any hotel group, more so than any airline. And they don't actually produce anything. All they do is, is orchestrate information and opinions shared by their users. The other thing that this digital revolution is doing is it's raising the levels of our accountability. There's no, more su there's no such thing as a secret anymore. If the CIA can't keep a secret, none of us can keep a secret. People can now see further inside our organizations than at any time in history. So this is changing the way we need to think about reputation management. Because the other thing that's going on is what I like to call business modification. 
In other words, our very, uh, the business models that we, we base, the way we do business on are changing. People that used to be in the services industry are moving into the product industry. People who used to produce products are now creating services around those products. In other words, the entire business model is fundamentally changing. That certainly affected the business that I used to have. You know, I had an advertising agency for 20 years. You know, and when I began my advertising career some 25, 30 years ago, this is what my secretary was supposed to look like. This is not what my secretary looks like in 2016. This is what my secretary looks like today. I mean, I've updated the wallpaper. You know, this is the office I was supposed to have when I began my advertising career. But this is what my office really looks like. And the other thing is, this is the model of leadership I was promised when I began my career. Me at the top, obedient minions beneath me. But you know what? That's not the model of leadership that showed up. I was recently doing a, a consult for a military consortium, and a military consortium is basically a group of 20 or 30 ex-military guys in a room, and it's always just men. And as you can imagine, when 20 or 30 military guys get together in a room, there's a lot of posturing going on, a lot of who's the biggest, who's the toughest, that kind of thing. Fortunately, I watched a lot of Jean-Claude Van Damme movies as a kid, so I reckon I held my own. But as this posturing was going on, the door at the back of the room opened up, and this old guy in chinos and a polo shirt entered the room and the posturing stopped, and the bragging stopped, and the boasting stopped. And it was immediately obvious to me that a real leader had entered the room. So I said to the Special Forces guy I was talking to, who's that? And he said, that's Major General Jim Molan. He's a legend. Now, it turns out, Jim ran the war in Iraq. He worked with the Australians, the Canadians, the Americans, the Brits, the Poles. And I wanted to get a sense from him, how did, you, how did you manage that as a leader? How did you get such different groups, different military disciplines, different languages, different religions, different values? How did you get them to work together as a cohesive whole? And it turns out he's a bit of a Gruen Transfer fan, so we had a fantastic conversation. Now, Jim's one of those old school men. You know, he's a real man. He kind of reminded me of my grandfather. You know, Jim Mullen's the kind of guy they base those Chuck Norris facts on. You know, when Jim Molan does push-ups, he doesn't lift himself up. He pushes the world down. He's that guy. And I said to him, Jim, how did you manage such a disparate group of people? He said, you know what, Dan? I led the most highly dis disciplined, the most well-resourced, and the most well-trained workforce on the planet, and it was my honour to serve with them. And then he eyeballed me, and he said, Dan, what kind of people do you command? And I said, creative people, Jim. And Jim Molan looked at me, and he said, you poor bastard. Because Jim Bowler knows if he ever gives an order, his people will snap to attention and say, Sir, yes, sir. If I was ever to give my people anything resembling an order, they would tell me to go and do something to myself that might be a lot more enjoyable if another participant was involved. I think we all know what that model of leadership feels like. But you know what? I think that's the model of leadership we're all faced with today. It's no longer about the hierarchy. It's about how do we create cultures of the willing, cultures of the voluntary, cultures of the enthusiastic, and this goes beyond our stuff. It goes towards our customers. How do we create a culture, a community, that our staff and our customers are both members of? So that's one, that, some, one of the things that's, that's driving the change in business is this idea of, of business modification. And part of this is actually being fueled by expectation inflation. In other words, our staff and our customers' expectations are getting higher and higher and higher. And I found a formula that I think represents this expectation inf inflation brilliantly. It's basically that disappointment equals expectation divided by reality. And I think that's really true. I mean, if you think about it, the hamburger that you buy never quite looks like the one in the window, does it? The snowman you build yourself, nothing like the Christmas card. Firemen sadly never live up to the calendar. And I'll be honest with you, the less said about this picture, the better. But as expectations go up and up and up, what that means is good is no longer good enough. It's no longer good enough just to do what it says on the tin. It's no longer good enough just to offer a good product or a good service. We now need to uh, you know, deliver value above and beyond expectations. We need to deliver intangible value above and beyond the functional, above and beyond the utilitarian. And if you think about the products that are winning in the marketplace today, the products that are winning are the ones that have great intangible value. If you think back to when the first iPhone launched in Australia, if you think about the, the functionality of it, it couldn't send an MMS. Now, at the time, even the cheapest, nastiest phone on the marketplace could send a picture file to another phone. And yet people lined up through the night. They camped out, not to buy concert tickets, but for the opening of a retail store to buy a phone that didn't work. 
but it had intangible value. It said something about who I was. It said I was an early adopter of technology. It said I was cool. It said I was part of the in crowd. You know, and we justified the lack of functionality. I was one of them. I would just say, yeah, I just take the photo, then wait till I get home, hook it up to my computer, sync it through iTunes, and then email it at a later date. It's just as convenient. Of course, it was nowhere near as convenient, but we justified it because it had intangible value. You know, look at something like, like the Philippe Stark orange juicer. You know, the Philippe Stark orange juicer will take juice out of an orange. I mean, it does make your kitchen wall, floor, and counter look like an orange serial killer's been at work, and it costs $150. But that's mostly margin, because it's not about juicing the orange. It's about my design aesthetic. It's about the impression I want to make on people when they come to my home. The, you know, the kind of environment I'm trying to create. That's where the intangible value is. And that's where products are winning in the marketplace today. It's not just about the functional value you build into your product or your service. It's about the intangible value that you offer your customers when they do business with you. So let's have a look at, at how we can build a brand that punches above its weight, how we can build a brand that, that really brings people to them, that people love. First thing I want to say is, show me who you help me to be. Show me who you help me, me to be. Now, why does that matter in marketing? It matters because all human behavior is driven by our sense of identity. In other words, everything we do, every decision we make, every product that we buy is filtered through who we think we are and who we want to project to the world that we are. Let me just step back and run you through a little of the history of the behavioural sciences. Now, it really kicked off in the 1600s with Blaise Pascal and decision theory. And Pascal's theory was, was that human beings look at all of their available options, then they weigh up the pros and cons, and then people make the most logical decision possible. How's that working for you? Of course, that's not what people do at all. And then people like Daniel Goleman came along and said, well, no, it's not just about intellectual intelligence. It's also about emotional intelligence. EQ is just as important as IQ. And of course, he's right. You know, every decision we make is filtered through how that decision will ultimately make us feel. Now, of course, we post-rationalise a lot of those emotional decisions, don't we? You know, there's a lot of men in the advertising industry driving around in Porsches that can tell you all about Porsche's racing heritage, German engineering and aerodynamics, but all we're really after is some special hugs from women half our age. You know, but we like to post-rationalise that very emotional decision. But then people started to wonder, well, what's the most important emotion if we want to be influential? What's the most important question we can ask if we want to be engaging, if we want to be persuasive? And people like Simon Sinek came along and said, well, it's all about why. Why drives how, which determines what. Viktor Frankl said exactly the same thing 50 years earlier in Man's Search for Meaning. With a big enough why, you can achieve any what. And they're right. The problem with why is it's often temporary. Anyone who's ever been on a diet knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, if you've got a big enough why, maybe a school reunion or a wedding or a hot date, you can lose the weight, right? You get on the treadmill, you eat nothing but lettuce, and you look fabulous. But then six months goes by and the why disappears. And all of a sudden, you're back sitting on the sofa in your sweatpants, watching Oprah and eating chicken out of a bucket. Because at some point, you remember, you're the fat one off the grill and transfer. And our identity, the need for identity congruence, drives our decision making. Unless you're able to create an identity that's more powerful, more compelling, more attractive than the one I currently hold, it's really hard to drive behavioral change. Because this sense of identity drives why we buy products. You know, people don't say, well, I bought a Macintosh computer or I bought some Apple hardware. They say, I'm a Mac. They want to say something about themselves. They want to say, I'm a crazy one. I'm a misfit. I'm a round peg in a square hole. Mostly what they're looking to say is, I'm not a PC. And this behavior shows up everywhere. You know, people buy dogs that look like them. People buy cars that look like them. There are kids in the United States with names like Mercedes and Lexus, and they need your help. So this sense of identity drives everything we do. It drives how we purchase, the associations we make, the, the kind of organizations that we want to do business with. And to continue enjoying this presentation, download Bryn, the world's first business advisor in your pocket. To find out more, visit Bryn.ai or search the App Store today.